So, uh, first, a little bit about me. I've been working for Acquia since 2011, uh, based in Lisbon. Uh, I'm now working with the site factory where we actually produce sites uh, in an easy form uh, as a principal SRE. Um, I co authored that book, uh, it's called Seeking SRE uh, from O'Reilly. And I, saw, I also founded uh, the Portuguese uh, Drupal Association. Um, and fun fact, I have two kids. Uh, started using Linux with Slackware in 1994 um, and did some uh, performance on stage back then. Um, today we will talk about Drupal, the LAMP stack, and hosting Drupal on Ubuntu. Uh, the CI, CD, and feature delivery uh, leading to reliability problems and toil. Uh, how SRE actually comes to the rescue uh, using um, SLOs, error budgets, embracing uh, operational responsibility and blameless postmortems. And then we will finalize by looking ahead and with some questions. So let, let's start with Drupal. I think it's, a, it's already a good thing. So, Acquia is primarily uh, a dedicated Drupal hosting. It's, it's running on top of uh, around of 22,000 uh, Ubuntu instances, um, and it's providing the leading cloud platform uh, for building, delivering, and optimizing web digital experiences. And in my mind, in our minds, the most engaging digital experiences are built with Drupal, Drupal 8. Think for a moment of the brands and companies shaped by Drupal. The power brands. The makers. the institutions, the cultural icons that unite us, the ones that make us sing, carry us away. The agile, The resilient. And the ones who support them. The developers. The millions across the globe. The marketers. The front line behind the glass. The road warriors. The people out in the wild fighting every day. The agencies, the masters of strategy and emotion. So what do all these people have in common? The digital platform that powers some of the most exciting experiences on the web. Drupal. So Drupal is the world's most popular enterprise class web content uh, management system. Uh, it's developed by more than 46,000 developers that are part of 1.3 million users registered on Drupal.org. Also last year, uh, we had around 1,000 companies contributing back with uh, 8,000 lines of code. Um, actually, not lines of code, actually code contributions. And this is reflected in millions of websites with 12% market share. I think that already says something because we have an annual growth uh, in our open source software called Drupal of 51%. Um, every day, uh, Drupal is becoming a more popular, uh, more powerful platform for companies and individuals with a whole community 
innovating, uh, we get uh, new features, and after before we know uh, we actually need them. A very good example is the layout builder that you can see here. So yeah, now, as you probably all know, that Drupal, that old thing that you just saw, works on top of what we call the LAMP stack. LAMP stack, MySQL, also. Ends in the air if you already know the LAMP, the LAMP stack. You don't know the LAMP stack? Oh, you know the LAMP stack. LAMP? LAMP, okay, this, this is also good. Good, so uh, LAMP is not a software, but a set of uh, four. Uh, so like in this case, it will be Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Of course, the um, several components can be replaced uh, by other options like uh, Nginx instead of Apache, MariaDB instead of MySQL. Uh, this set supports what we call the web service uh, how our Drupal application lives in it. Uh, and Drupal, whether containerized or not, uh, for aqueous setup, um, runs within this LAMP stack. Uh, here you see um, the Drupal doc root, where we actually keep the core files, the vendor files, the modules, the teams, and then we have a file system for uh, static files, upload files, uh, compressed, uh, you have also inside of that uh, static file folder, you have the CSS, the JavaScript, and then uh, to keep the data, not the file data, but the real data, we have uh, uh, several MySQL flavors, uh, including uh, uh, MySQL flavors would be uh, MariaDB or Percona servers, um, but we can also have uh, Postgres or Redis or something else. So one of the tasks that our teams in Acquia do is hosting the biggest Drupal sites in the world. And there, here are uh, some numbers. So we have around uh, 20, 21, actually that's the, the real number, 20, 20, 21,600 instances, um, 25,000 production sites, we transfer around uh, 14 petabytes uh, of data per month. Uh, we have 2.8 petabytes of data storage. Uh, we receive uh, around 3,000 calls per second, uh, API calls, and we are scattered around uh, 20 availability zones and eight regions. Uh, and we are proud to do that. Uh, using a very well-known Linux uh, distribution. Uh, it's called Ubuntu, uh, since we started, basically. At the minim minimum, using Ubuntu um, hosting a Drupal site requires uh, a single Drupal LAMP server, um, a firewall connected to the internet, and then a user to actually connect to it. And we have a couple of uh, different products. Uh, some are simplified, like this uh, ACP here, um, with a single web um, and DB servers. That's including a reverse proxy caching and then a load balancing server. Uh, some web servers, uh, some database servers, uh, and this gives the 
the customer 99.9% uptime um, and they don't pay for that. It's just the uptime they get there. But this one is a bit more complex, which is the cloud, Acquia Cloud Enterprise, which can scale to several dozens of servers, uh, depending on what uh, each layer needs. And of course, for more demanding customers, we separate each layer in high availability for several instances. Um, but the biggest point here as an SRE is that we actually guarantee that 99.95% they, uh, they have of uptime. It's guaranteed. And to enable that, um, we have not only people behind customer support, but an entire engineering team doing automation and launching new features for it. So yeah, in Acquia Cloud, the demand for features is very high. Since the beginning of Acquia, we have been applying agile uh, concepts like continuous integration, continuous delivery. And as every company, we deliver new features regularly uh, for our product and customers. And there is one particular feature that we cannot live without. Does anyone here know what is the most important feature here? Is it the latest feature or? Being available. Exactly, that the product works, right? So yeah, how about the 503 feature? <laughs> In case it doesn't work. I'm pretty sure we all agree that the most important thing is that the product works, that it is reliable. So reliability is the most uh, fundamental feature in any product. A system isn't very useful if nobody can use it uh, because reliability is so critical. SREs are focused on finding ways to improve the design and operation systems to make them more scalable, reliable, and efficient. So let's now dive into this specific, uh, this couple of specific problems um, that we have. In our case, we always had a very mature monitoring posture that would guarantee that any site would alert uh, either a support or operations person within 10 minutes, even if the problem would be related to the, to the customer's code instead of ours. So as you can imagine, people get overwhelmed uh, with alerts without the means to address them quickly. Um, and this always results in massive burnout and churn. So we have a disconnect here. While operation tries to keep the service up and reliable and gets rewarded for that, developers are rewarded by the number of features shipped. So if you see it the dev way, products features would be shipped constantly and low time would be spent on increasing reliability or supporting ops with proper tooling or automation, whatever. If you see it the ops way, releases would be minimal to avoid outages and time uh, would not be spent firefighting, but only doing uh, tickets and customer support activities. Yeah, okay. But features are important and they need to be released. An ops only solution is to keep products running. So this increase, increases toil um, and they have no time to automate that work. What types of toil do we have? Manual, repetitive, automatable, like things we actually see they could be actually automated, but we don't have time to automate it. Or tactical, you're doing something and some, uh, 
suddenly it, you're interrupted and you have unplanned work to do and you just have to leave what you're doing and go there. Things that you do that don't have any enduring value, like launching a server just to test something and then put it down, you, you didn't gain anything with that. And the worst of it is like, it has whole end growth with service. And that's bad. See that line there? It's <laughs> you're learning class. Um, because if you are successful in your business, then the workload will be that ON growth line, right? Because you're growing and there is no, nothing you can do to actually stop that line unless you cap toil at 50% on those SRE teams and leave most of their time to actually write code and reduce that toil. So enter SRE. Uh, please raise your hand if you have heard about SRE before. SRE, Site Reliability Engineering, okay. Um, who's applying it? Oh, really? That's nice. So what exactly is Site Reliability Engineering? So, yeah. First and foremost, SREs are engineers, right? They apply the principles of computer science and engineering to the design and development of competing systems. And actually, if you don't know it yet, this is the well-kept secret from Google since they started. Um, sometimes their task is writing the software for those systems. Sometimes their task is building all the additional pieces those system needs like backups, load balancing, et cetera. So how do we solve our reliability and toil problems? This, actually this conflict is solvable. The solution is called error budgets. Everyone in the organization needs to agree on some kind of error budget that they use for this to work. Therefore, SRE, only prevents releasing or launches if the error budget is low. So let's, let's explain a little bit more of that, SLOs and error budget. So releasing features, as we said, is the developer's main objective, but the cause, but that causes toil, right? So, who here has already had a disastrous deployment in production? Like, it took several customers down for a lot of time. Maybe some don't admit, but that's fine. Um, I, I think it's recording this way, not that way. So that's no problem. Anyway, the business or the product, they need to establish. This, this, this actually comes from higher up down. It's not a thing that only the engineers can do. It, it needs to be supported by the stakeholders. They need to establish how much is the availability target for this system. Once you have done that, one minus uh, the availability target is what we call the air budget. So the air budget is less this little line there, see it there in red? This is what we can use to actually launch features, make tests, do whatever you want to do in production. Just don't blow it. And, and actually, if you agree on defining like we have in this, in this, uh, in this picture, 99.9%, .9%, which leaves you with 0.1% of errors, it means that you have 73 minutes per month that you can just use um, to do whatever you need. And yeah, this is the, I, I think it's the most difficult part is to have everybody agreeing on that. So getting stakeholder alignment 
is probably the biggest challenge. So service level objectives, which is that thing in the middle, uh, they specify that target level. Because SLO, SLOs are key to maintaining uh, data-driven decisions about reliability, they are at the core of SRE practices. So SRE can start by helping the software engineers specifying which indicators, which monitoring they can actually use to get that data to form the SLO. And then we go to the SLOs, we define the SLOs, and then in the end, we actually get a true value of SLA for the customer. It's not the other way around, right? I can answer questions about this if necessary. Obviously, service level objectives, like in anything, cannot be 100%. The goal of SRE team is not to have zero outages. We have to set realistic goals uh, so that the development team can spend the error budget on anything like launching features, maximum velocity, for instance. So the SRE objective is to align with product devs to spend the error budget on maximum, that meant maximum velocity. And that would keep the, the, the toil at the minimum because we already know, okay, this is the maximum we're, we're going to have, uh, have on the ops teams. But if you run out of budget, you just need to do more testing between the releases. So embracing operational responsibility. We have several products in, in Acquia. Uh, it's not, it's not like, like Oracle because Oracle is not, doesn't have anything in production, I think. But if they, if they had, it would be like, okay, let's, let's ship this. Um, but they would have to do an ORA or at least a launch readiness criteria, which is like a checklist. When you get on the plane, you see, okay, I have enough fuel. I have this part, the, the wings are okay. This, 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 okay, I can fly now. I can launch. But if you don't do that, which I believe it's most of the people because they are crying for DevOps. No, we need DevOps. Okay, so this is the solution. Creating a checklist which calls the operation or responsibility assessment. They need to do that before they actually launch. And another important thing, either in production or either while trying to release, and this is a Google thing, is to have blameless postmortems. Like in every DevOps approach, one of the most uh, important things are, uh, is the cultural mindset. Postmortems are a process, usually performed in the conclusion of an incident, and that exposes what went well or bad. And the investigation should reveal what happened in detail, find all the root causes, assign actions to correct the problem or improve how it's addressed the next, the next time. Yeah, and remember, you cannot fix people. You can only fix systems and process. This is really key. It is critical that all postmortems are blameless. So we can understand honestly and truly what happened, why the people involved did what they did at the time, and how to make the system more reliable. Even though it has unreliable components like the power supply, the humans, the disks, etc. Right? So if you are interested in this sub subject, there's, there's a very good book from uh, Sidney Decker. He's a, a professor in uh, Sweden um, uh, on, on human factors and flight safety. So looking ahead, 
we have missions and we have visions in Acquia. And we provide lead leadership for running, for, for running Aquius Cloud products and service in most sustainable and scalable way. Using systems, engineering best practices, agile and change management. And this, all of this is only to create a more mature operational posture. In conclusion, uh, site reliability enables agility and stability. SREs are software engineers. They try to automate themselves out of the job. I would be glad if someone would say, you don't have an, any more job, you can just go on with your life. Yeah, go surf uh, to your side or something. So my, my advice, uh, if you want, like, uh, both, both these, book, these books are, are, are actually published by, by Google. Because they were the ones that actually kept this secret until uh, a few years ago. So when they saw that the DevOps movement was getting uh, traction, they thought, well, we probably need to talk about this SRE thing that we're keeping from uh, for uh, only for us, and it's being talked out there as similarly DevOps. So SRE is kind of the practical way you implement DevOps with some technical guides and some um, with a workbook and some technical guides. Implement SLOs. Error budgets, perform blameless postmortems, and start fighting toil. Questions? I know we're only a few. This has a lot to take. I know. Two, one, one, two. Yeah. Um, I was curious. Uh, like in the beginning of the slides, you were showing a bit of how you are constructing the infrastructure. Um, have I would like to, to know if you can shed a little bit of light on, on how are you doing the deployments, uh, what kind of software are you using to deploy into Amazon, are you using things like uh, Ansible or Puppet or uh, anything like that? So, that's a good thing. Uh, so we're moving, we're moving now to actually start to use, uh, well, we're, we're not moving, we're already moving. Um, since last year, um, on things uh, like Kubernetes. And this will change all of the paradigm that we have currently. Because currently, what we do is actually, we have a lot of Puppet, we have a lot of Ruby, we have a lot of other tools that support that release. That release is not easy, that's why we have SREs implemented in each product because every time we want to do a release to production, like the devs just say, oh, it's not my problem. No, dude, now it's your problem. Now it's your problem because if the company fails, it's not enough for you to be sitting right beside the administration. You're now a part of this, what we do that's why we have DevOps, right? right? Okay, I don't know if that answers your questions because sometimes people are more interested in tools, I'm more interested in process. Yeah, I understand, but, but also, uh, now that you referred to Kubernetes, I'm also curious about it. Uh, so I'm gonna follow up with, uh, are you deploying the LAMP stack on Kubernetes as well? The whole yeah, sure. MySQL, uh, sure. Apache, yeah. Mumbo Jumbo? Yeah, it's, it's everything Drupal needs. That's why I explained the beginning, saying, yeah, right, this is what we have now, but th this could be containerized. I, I don't know if you remember me saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. this could be containerized. All right. Or <laughs> serverless. <laughs> yeah, and I know some guys, they want to put uh, Drupal serverless. Yeah, it's <laughs> fine. That doesn't exist. <laughs> There's some bare metal somewhere. Of course. 
anyway, uh, just 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 to uh, a little bit touch that um, point, uh, Amazon has the biggest operational team currently. I think it's the biggest one. I could be wrong, because all of the problem you just are buying their time to solve your problem. Yeah. Right. Because every time you actually, what you said, uh, when when you try to release something, are you using some Amazon tools? You're not solving the problem. You're just buying the time to sell that to solve that problem from someone else. But the developers are ah, oh, yeah, this is all like I'm just pushing yeah, code. That's... Oh, it failed. Doesn't matter. Someone is solving it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and but I want to solve that process. Yeah. I think that's wrong. There are human beings involved here. More questions? That's not my decision. Can you can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, it, it, maybe you can give me both. Why? What do I have to do to get you to use MySQL? MySQL. So, <laughs> so the first thing that happened there—it's not my decision. First, it's not my decision. But I, I was, as I, as I said, I'm since the beginning in the company, and um, we tried to have. This was in 2000. When when was MySQL went to uh, Oracle? Okay, so it was too soon, I think, for that support to happen, right? I I think um, I'm not sure, and I'm not going to say any stakes here, but I think we initiated conversations with several vendors to actually support because in this kind of things like some someone is developing it's it's always the problem developer operations develop operations or putting in production and in this case someone is developing and supporting some product percona had the best support so we went with that that made our our decision yeah, yeah support is and development Yeah, we, we that's one of the reasons we didn't start with Red Hat. Didn't make sense to us. Coming from the Drupal community, you know, Acqui is, is where it was created by the same person that created Drupal. Greece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, more questions. If not, then we'll close the day and uh, wish you all a rest of pleasant day. Thank you.